right. to iterate on. You know, if you, if you get it wrong, uh, it's wrong, you know? So you need to come out of the design phase and start building it, and you better hope that design is right, because there's not a whole lot of room for, for correction. So you had these phases and gates. You'd start off, you'd, you'd end up in the, uh, you know, in the customer negotiation phase. So you'd try to lock down with the customer exactly what they wanted. And you, you, at the end of the day, you want them to sign off so that they couldn't come back to you and say, hey, you know, actually we meant you, you need to do this. Because that was really quite difficult uh, w within the process itself. So once you had that, you had a group of people, architects or, you know, other planners, and they'd go into a room and they'd carve out these detailed specs. Uh, and once you had the detailed specs, you'd chuck that over the wall and you'd give that to the, uh, you'd give that to the, the developers and they would go ahead and they'd you know, develop this stuff. Uh, then they'd test it and then they'd release it into production and realize that the customer most of the time didn't actually want that, um, that you know, they weren't able to clearly articulate in the first phase what they wanted, um, you know, but that's what they got and this was after a year of development and uh, you know, here you are. So why do I have the picture of the ship at the canal? Because that, that's what turning around in, in the, I guess they call it a waterfall process. I mean, really, w the name isn't important. It's just any process that has a series of phases and gates where you must complete one phase in order to move on to the next phase, and there's not really a, lo a, lot, of, uh, a lot of attention paid to, to iterating across it. <clears throat> so I, I, this is humorous to me. I started Orbitz five years ago, and five years ago, Orbitz was old school. And we had a... We had a, a piece of paper. Can everybody hear me when I step away from the mic? Does that work for the camera? No? Okay. I guess I'm tied here. Um, so we, we, uh, we had this piece of paper, and it had 36 steps on it. You know, it was like the typical flow chart with triangles and diamonds and, and ovals and so on. And some of them were really big, like, you know, uh, requirements, review session, and this and that and the other thing, sign off, you know, all these big things. And then somewhere in the middle of the page there was this really tiny little oval and it said, uh, develop the software. And it was one step out of 36 other like giant gates. And like it was only that one, you never went back to it, it was just develop the software, like kind of an afterthought and then you go on with all this other stuff. And you know, that, that's, that's where we're coming from, that's where we're, you know, that's what we're getting away from. So, so the, the problem with, with all this stuff was that it was too, it's too functional focused. You know, it didn't, it didn't really take into account uh, the medium that we were working with. So imagine, you know, imagine trying, and by medium I mean software as opposed to hardware, or metal, or wood, or stone. So imagine trying to build a business this way. You know, you say, all right, I'm gonna build a business plan, and now I'm gonna go get some loans, and then I'm gonna build the business exactly to the specs of these business plans, and then I'm gonna open my doors, and the customers are gonna come in, and, and they're not buying, but I'm not gonna change. I have to go through a rigorous process of change requests and all kinds of other stuff in order to even take into account any kind of customer feedback. You'd fail. Businesses don't operate that way because businesses intrinsically or well, I don't know how they got there, but they recognize the you know the medium that they're working with, its processes, its sales, its people, it's flexible. You can take feedback, you can incorporate it, you can turn it around, you can make changes, and you can do that relatively quickly. Well, software we now realize is is very much the same way. So we we want to take feedback, we want to iterate over it, we want to make something that uh, doesn't just immediately meet the customer's needs, but we want to give the customer something early and then we want to change it as we go along so that at the end of the day, uh, after a number of iterations, we have something that makes sense to the customer, whether it be a software or a business. So, Agile software comes along and Agile software is really a reaction to the way that we were doing things and you know recognition of of the medium that we were working in so i've said so it, it's not that the way we were doing things was wrong it's not that you know it was fundamentally broken it feels to any one any of us that have worked in that environment that it was fundamentally broken but for people that had never seen anything else you know you recognize problems with it but it wasn't that it was fundamentally broken it was that we just weren't competitive as, as competitive as we could be. There were efficiencies that we could find that would allow us to be better at delivering software and recognizing the flexibility of software was one of those things. So if you're a company that doesn't recognize the flexibility or just a project even that doesn't recognize the flexibility of software, you're gonna move slower than somebody that does. The movement that came along that first really recognized this flexibility was, uh, was the agile movement, lean. Uh, come out of manufacturing. There's a, it's, flexibility is not the only thing. That's what I'm harping on right now. There's a number of, of uh, 
salient qualities to software design that, that drives agile. Uh, things like empirical process control, which is just a big word for saying, uh, I'm going to react to change as it comes. Uh, you know, so in any sufficiently complex system, if you try to centrally control it, think back even to, uh, you know, economic systems. You have markets versus a controlled market. Now, market's a really complicated thing. Letting the market react to change breeds a more efficient market than trying to control it from the top, from the center. In order to control it, you've got to create a lot of bureaucracy. That slows things down, and you have shortages and surpluses and all this kind of thing. It's the same thing with software. Software is a complex system. You need to be able to react to it, to change with it as it goes. It's more like surfing than designing a building. So here comes Agile, and it, it uh, this is from the Agile Manifesto. You can go on the internet and find this. And so it says, we value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So again, just, hey, software is flexible. Um, I, you know, we're not centrally controlling this thing. We don't need a bunch of processes because those just slow us down. We'll just go, over, go across the, you know, the hallway and talk to that guy, or maybe he's even sitting right next to me. Um, or we're going to release the software really soon so that the customer who isn't sitting right next to me can give me some feedback right away. Working software over comprehensive documentation, same thing. Instead of spending a ton of time building out a big spec, why don't I just build something and put it out and let the customer talk about it? And again, I'm flexible. Uh, I'm responding to change. I can go ahead and modify that so we finally get him something that he cares, that he, that he wants. So customer collaborate. You can see they're all kind of circling around the sort of the same thing. Is there, a, yeah, so, so software is flexible, but not, and, and this whole time, just raise your hand, we'll do questions the whole time. Um, software is, you know, flexible, but it's not infinitely flexible, right? And there's this notion that you can architect yourself into a corner. So there's, there's definitely room for all the things that are in small letters. It's not that we're saying they're, they're, you shouldn't do them. And that's one of the things that gave Agile kind of a bad name, is that people thought, well, we should only do these other things. So they used the Agile as, a, as an excuse not to document. I worked at a company a while ago, and I won't mention the name, but before I'd gotten there, there were... Uh, there were a bunch of people there that had tried to do an agile movement, and agile just became synonymous with like uh, writing whatever you want, not designing it, never documenting it, just sort of flying by the seat of your pants, just hacking. And of course, that didn't work out very well for them. Agile's lean, agile's absolutely not that. Uh, as a response, to, we got to see both both sides of the just coin of horror at that place. As a response to that, the, uh, the CFO, not, not CTO, the, the, the chief financial officer uh, took it into his head that he, he knew better because he'd read one book on the rational unified process. So he thought, you know, I, I know how we can do this. And he had the ear of the owner. And so next thing you know, we're, uh, we're writing uh, sequence diagrams and, and flow charts. And it, there's a series of seven diagrams that have to be done for each part of the system and big data dictionaries. That's when I left, but I don't even know if there's, I think they're probably still working on the sequence diagrams. Um, so let's put this in practical terms. What did, what did Agile do? It just, it just busted down these walls between, uh, between design, development, and testing. Um, Essentially, what we said, instead of, instead of having all these people working separately, we're going to smash that down. We're going to co-locate them. They're all going to work together. We're going to value the collaboration. We're not going to have walls that foster meetings and misunderstandings and all the rest of this kind of thing. So we'll bust that down. And then we're going to say one really key thing. Um, how many people in the room have heard the, the phrase out of Agile, done means tested? Yeah. So done means tested was really key, right? Because what did that do? it made it everybody's responsibility to get the software out the other end, to, to get it, te right? So I'm going to write something, um, and I'm not just going to say it's done and huck it over the wall at, at uh, you know, at testing. Um, and similarly, product, you know, the designers aren't going to move me on to the next thing to build until we're actually done with the thing we, we previously built. And that means that we have an automated unit test or it's been manually tested or whatever, but we all need to work together to facilitate this thing being tested, checked off, so that we can move on to the next thing. And we're going to stop production. We're not going to keep going if we can't get the thing tested because we're not done with the previous task. So that was a very key thing in bringing everybody together. Now, over here, you see what's missing? So there's only three things there. We've got design, development, and testing. 
but there's no operations. And you know why? Why aren't there? Uh, why aren't there any operations? A whole lot of reasons. Um, you know, cultural differences between ops and dev that are fairly significant. Uh, a technical hurdle. So, you know, between product and development, mixing those two groups together, designers and developers, what do you need? You need like a Jira system or a you know a trouble ticketing system and uh, some paper. You need to change the way you write stories instead of writing requirements. It's all pretty simple. It's all pretty fluffy. It's pretty soft. Um, it's not really very technical. You can implement that just by having people change their behavior, which is easier than uh, you know moving machines around or changing uh, you know, hardened infrastructure and so on, right? Um, and then I think the biggest thing that that uh, caused these people to split was uh, was misaligned incentives. And uh, I was listening to a talk by Jesse Robbins, the CEO of OpsCode at DevOps Days a, while, a little while ago, and he had said, you know, you've got a a local optimization problem, and so so here, here's the deal, you know what, what's operations paid to do? They're they're paid to keep the site up and running, and if change is the thing that makes the site fail, then you want to militate against change, right? You don't want change. You want to force change out of the equation, um, and that's how you you know that's what you're paid. That's what you're graded on, right? Development's graded on exactly the opposite thing. They're graded on how much change they can create and how fast they can do it. So you've got this misalignment of incentives, and then you get this local optimization. When you have when you, when you have something like this, you get local optimization if the groups are split. If there's a the, you know this. If this brick wall sits in between ops and dev, they don't talk to one another, they're split apart, we're not valuing communication over documentation and process, then you get local optimization. So dev says, I know the whole goal of the company, somewhere in the back of my head, I know the whole goal of the company is, uh, is that we all communicate and that software goes out the fastest, right? And ops say, somewhere in the back of my head, I also know that we need to do the same thing. But guess what, locally, I'm not getting graded on that. I'm getting graded on, uh, I'm getting graded on how, how well I can maintain this site, how well I can prevent the change from happening. And so I'm gonna optimize locally because that's what matters to me. So at the end of the day, we've gotta find a way to crush that wall. And Agile and Lean has a whole lot of lessons for us in how to do that. But this problem isn't just a, a process one, it's a technology problem. So here again is that full circle. We need to, uh, you know, we need to close that loop. Uh, we need to, you know, get over the cultural hurdles, and we need to have all these people sitting together. We need to have people kind of, you know, operating their own software, developers, ops, product, everybody kind of sitting in the same room. So that done means testing thing. We take it just a little bit farther, and we say done means in production. So. What good does inventory do you? If I have a bunch of widgets sitting in a pile, you know, at my at my factory, and they're not actually in things that customers are using, that's not doing me a lot of good. It's just work in process. It's sitting there. It's no good. We need to uh, get this stuff out there to the customer. Um, we need to bring every and we need to bring everybody together to do it. And the way we bring everybody together is you know, co-location, whatever, you know, higher communication, and then by saying it's everybody's job, we're not done with whatever it is we're doing until it's actually out in production. And that's gonna bring us to the, uh, you know, kind of the more, more technical part of this whole talk. So before I jump in there, does anybody have any questions on uh, just what we've covered before, before we move on to sort of part two? All good? All right. Okay. Uh, you know what, actually I want to make one comment that I caught here in my notes. You know, this bringing, you know, you saw this, uh, this full circle here. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, and I, you know, now we see two points. We can kind of, we see a pattern here. You know, it's all about bringing people together. At the end of the day, just in, in the way that you think about software and the way that things should be organized, really what we get to here is that silos and walls are bad. Um, you know, I've got a team that I'm working with right now where, where we took uh, design, which is a shared service, and we brought design onto the team. So we no longer have design, you know, like actual graphic design for websites over here. They're on the team. We've seen tremendous improvements from there. You bring ops people on the team, you see great improvements. You bring product people on the team, you see great improvements. Individual specialization, but get rid of that local optimization. Bring people together. I think that's really the theme of all of this stuff. DevOps is kind of special, though, because we got to there's some technology we got to work on to make it happen. So let's talk about the tool chain. And again, now, 
when I go through this, I'm not saying that any one of the, any, not even any of the processes that I'm going to talk about here, I'm not saying they're the best, the ultimate, the, you know, the pinnacle of where we could be, that you must use these tools and do it exactly this way. When you're watching this, yeah, look, look, look at the tools and, and, and try to learn from the techniques, but also think to yourself, you know, maybe that's, be critical, you know, maybe that's a bad way to do it, maybe you want to do it another way. One of the really interesting things about this space right now is that there's so much room for innovation, there's so much room to make things better. I know three ways that that I could have presented this or that I could have built this stuff. So I challenge you to just be critical. You don't have to yell critical things out, but <laughs> um, be critical in your head, you know, and, and go home and, and make this better and write a blog on it or, or, you know, communicate it with somebody, share it. There's a lot of sharing going around on the city. Come to the meetups. All right, so what are the tools of the chain, the tool chain? Is everybody familiar with the tool chain pattern? That's a, a one that'll keep coming up and up, coming up over and over again in, in kind of a, uh, just the delivery of software and administration and so on. So version control. Version control is absolutely key. Um, plays a very central role. It's probably, I don't know, it's probably the most important tool in all this. Artifact repo, separate from version control. Explain that. Config management, another, another big thing we're going to talk about. Packaging, something near and dear to my heart. Monitoring, this, this all... It's really pretty useless without monitoring. Building all this stuff without monitoring, which always, always, always is an afterthought, uh, is kind of like building a plane without gauges. You're good in that blue, sunny day, but the second the clouds roll in, you're screwed. You're, you know, you never find your way out of it. Uh, virtualization in the cloud. This is, uh, I think, one of the biggest enabling technologies of, uh, you know, of this of this decade. CI stands for continuous integration. Absolutely a, a pivotal technology here. And then, I, I say simple deployment scripts on here, but that, I think, now that I, I think about that, it's more of a typo. It's just really uh, deployment management. It doesn't have to be a simple script. I'm going to talk about a simple, you know, I'm going to talk about some simple stuff, but, uh, you know, depending on how complex your infrastructure gets over time, these things can become quite complex. And after, you know, a bunch of big companies or, or great open source projects build two or three of these systems, we'll start to see the commonality and we'll, we'll abstract that and we'll turn this into something that's more commoditized. But for now, you know, it's kind of the wild, wild west. I really wish I could walk away from this thing. So let's talk about uh, simple, happy, happy path, continuous deployment. Because continuous deployment, when I say there's a technical part to this whole thing, well, this is it, uh, or this is a, a, a big part of it. So at the end of the day, if done means in production, then, you know, if, if we can't get things to production very quickly, we're going to be holding, you know, we're going to be holding up the line. Um, the days of, the days of, you know, six weeks, two months, even two weeks to getting your software in production are coming to an end. And similarly, it's all about efficiencies, right? So similar to the way that if you're still doing waterfall software and your direct competitors do recognize the flexibility of the medium and he's doing things in an agile manner, he's going to blow your doors off. He's going to get stuff out to the customer faster. He's going to get feedback faster. He's going to change his software while you're still in a dark room somewhere thinking about how, how you're going to how you're going to build this thing. Well, this just takes it that final step, right? It just completes that whole chain. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna come up with a, a process and then a technical-based system for getting our software out fast, and we're gonna do that uh, in in small batch sizes. So it's gonna be a constant, constantly, you know, this whole empirical process control thing is gonna be a constant evolution. So let's just go through my 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 simple my simple steps. So write code for a couple hours. Notice I, I'm not saying a couple days, you know, like a couple hours, maybe a day, something like that. Uh, your, your story, this is driven a lot by story sizes, right? So you create a story. Is, that, is everybody familiar with, with stories? Yeah? Okay, cool. Um, so you create a story, and a story, you know, just represents a feature, something that should be going out to the customer, something the customer should see. So we're going we're gonna to build that story. Hopefully it only takes, you know, half a day of, of hard coding. Uh, and then we're going to check that into our version control system. That check-in process, somewhere circling around that check-in process, so I'm checking into a non-canonical repo, 
Somewhere around that check-in process, I need to have unit tests figured in there somewhere. I, I need to have a, a, clean, a clean build, compile, and unit tests figure it, you know, factoring in there somewhere. Easiest way to do it, um, sloppy but easy, is to you know, just write a script that, so you don't type git push, or sorry, you, you don't type uh, git uh, commit. commit. Um, you just run this commit script, and that thing's going to you know, build your local repo, compile it, and then, uh, and, or sorry, it's going to build it, and then it's just going to run your tests, right? And so if your tests fail, or you're, you know, you're missing artifacts, your, your clean build doesn't work, it's not going to let you actually commit that software. If it all does work, okay, now you're committing it. So this, and you can add more to that script if you want, but this, this process allows you to ensure just it's a baseline, right? A certain level of sanity to what it is that you're checking in. So as soon as you check in this stuff that's sane, so that when somebody else checks it out in order to do a review, which is the next step, it's not broken, it's not it works on my box, you know, this sort of thing. Um, so next step is code is reviewed and merged in with the main line. There's a whole bunch of tools uh, to be able to do this. You can, you know, Google them, or I, I, I think I talk about them later. Uh, depends on, you know, what time looks like. But a lot of tools that will help you do this. But anyways, somebody reviews the code, get a human eye on it, and then push it into the, uh, you know, into the canonical repo. From there, that mainline commit triggers a full build and a test run. And this is where CI comes in. Right? So you're going you're gonna to pull this stuff out. You're going to put it on you know, a, a, an environment that isn't your own. You're going to do a full build and a test run of... Uh, you know, of all the, uh, all the unit tests. If that all works out okay, that same system is going to trigger a package. So it's going to package up your software. And now in the simple, there's a couple ways you could go with this. Once you have that software packaged, you can check it into a repo manager, like a, a binary artifact manager. Um, Maven and tools like this in the Java world are, are big for this. I do the same thing, uh, you know, in, in my open source project in Erlang, but it's, it, you know, it's even simpler. Um, you, you either push that into the repo manager and it gets pulled out onto a staging machine or, or, or sorry, the artifact manager and it gets pulled out onto a staging machine or you push it directly onto a staging machine. So here's your virtualization. So staging sees a new instance of, you know, of a machine and environment provisioned for this particular package. Package gets pushed out, it gets installed, and that's where we're going to be running um, you know, our performance tests, our UI tests, things like Selenium, you know, which are basically just causing, you know, clicks in Firefox to happen to make sure that your, you know, that your UI is working. Uh, API, if you've got any, you know, if this is a, a backing service, you know, that we're hitting the API and we're making sure that it's performant. If all of that works, then the exact same package is not a different package. The exact same package gets pushed out to production, and it's the same package because it, so you don't want to drive this on build, and I'll talk about that later. But you're going to use that same package. Any questions on just this initial sort of like whirlwind through through this process? All right. So let's talk about the individual tools that that go in here. So I'm going to do two things. We'll talk about the tools. We'll cover some questions about the tools and just kind of best practice. I'll try to highlight those, but it's, it's, it's easier even with questions because then I can just draw on, you know, my experience and, and try to answer that stuff. But, um, and then I'll also, each one of the slides will have a couple open source tools. So if, if you can get the slides later, some of them are really obvious, like Git. If I'm, I'd be shocked if, no, if somebody in the room hadn't heard of Git. It's okay if you haven't, but... Um, you know, I'll put an open source tool on here that you can use to, to do this at home. And usually I'm tending toward the ones that I use. Um, in a couple instances, no. So this is where you, you store everything, your version control. Um, this is like, you know, like I said, a, a key part of, of, this, of this whole thing. You store almost everything here. And when I say everything, I'm talking about infrastructure as well. So the, the how your boxes are even set up should go in your version control, and I'll get in that. I'll get into that a little bit later when we start talking about uh, when we start talking about uh, configuration management. But essentially, you're going to check, you know, everything versioned into your version control. When you're doing this kind of development, if you're going to do continuous deployment, you so it's it's common for people to do branched development. So you're going to, you know, in in, in Git, you know, you're going to Git checkout dash b some branch, you know build on your branch, and then 
uh, push your code up maybe to the main line with a branch. In Subversion and CVS and all these, it's everything's on a branch. You got the central repo, everybody's working out of it. You're just pulling down kind of workspaces locally, and they're all in branches. And then when when you're done with some feature, you're merging that whole branch back in, and uh, you know, and then it's going through the process. So we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to work on head. We're going to, you know, work on mainline and not so much branching. You branch in your local workspace, that's fine. But when you get things in a canonical, you're working off of one line, um, and you're committing small little bits to that, you know, to that mainline. Packages. So consistency is really key. Uh, you know, key within within packaging, and that, that's really what they what they provide you. So. If you, a lot of people have probably run into this situation where to build, the, to build whatever it is you're building in development, you do it one way, you run these scripts, um, then you go on into the uh, you know, kind of the functional QA environment maybe and you build it a whole different way. Uh, and then you move into staging and it, yet again, it's a different way. And then in production, again, you know, it's a different way. Um, and, and that's not just limited to companies themselves. It's limited to, you know, people as well, you know, just small projects as well. You know, you have different OSs. You're doing your development on Mac and your, 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 uh, you know, your actual website target is some, you know, it's FreeBSD or something like that. So you've got entirely different ways of, of dealing with this stuff on both systems. Try to get away from that. If you're doing your development on, uh, if your production environment is one thing, try to do your development there. Uh, use configuration management to abstract certain things away so that you can, pr you know, provision environments uh, that are, you know, a bit more uniform. But at the end of the day, pick a package. And how do you know what packaging system to pick? The way you know what, what packaging system to pick is, so this is actually the first job I had. This One of the smartest guys there, this guy named Jerry, he was commissioned to do a... Uh, do an investigation to figure out what's the best package management system to use or what's the best packaging system to use. And what he ended up coming up with, his recommendation to the company was use the package management system that's native to the OS. So if you're deploying it on Solaris or you're deploying it on, you know, NetBSD, use, you know, package source. If you're deploying, I don't know who's doing that, but um, if, you're, if you're deploying it on, you know, Red Hat Linux, use RPM. If you're deploying on Debian, you know, use the, the Deb packages. Use the native one because that's, the tooling support is, uh, is worth enough that it's not worthwhile to hack in some, you know, different packaging system. If you're on Red Hat but you really love Debian packages and understand them, just uh, when in Rome, just abandon it, use, uh, Use what's native. Go with go with go with binary if if you can. And you know if you're doing if you're doing C code, then you want to get your stuff built on a you know on a machine that's well downstream on your CI server ideally, and then package the binaries and push them out. Every time you've got to rebuild something, you're opening yourself up to the possibility of injecting some change in there. So now what you, you know, you've got, you're, you're changing multiple variables in, in variables, right? You know, you're, you're changing your environment and you're potentially changing little things within the code. So you've got this, you've got this package that you ran through all of this testing and then you go and push it to a different environment and rebuild it. If something changed, you've just invalidated all that testing, right? Well, so, so are you talking about, so if you're talking about your, are you talking about your application level process, packages, the things you're doing at your company, or your, the general OS, so that's where we get into configuration management, uh, you know, and you use things like Puppet and Chef, um, so, so there, there you're looking to, you know, you see, bring up just a, a, a box that's, you know, bootstrap it, it's got minimal, minimal configuration on it, you're able to bootstrap them consistently, same way every single time. Now you're going to use a configuration management tool in order to provision those boxes and get them up to the, you know, the place that you want. You're going to check all that stuff into source control. So that's, that's the whole benefit of configuration management, there's all kinds of stuff swirling. The biggest benefit that they provide is being able to check that stuff into source control, version it. Now as you're going through and you're, you know, changing your packages and, uh, you know, what you, 
you want to evolve your infrastructure, you've got something in version control that you can go back to, forward from. So that's how you would manage that. As far as application level stuff, so you know, outside of what your infrastructure is, but now you're working with your, you know, your Java host that you built. Um, that's where this can, you know, where this comes into play. So you're, there's kind of the separation between. It's all code, but there's a little bit of separation here between the, the infrastructure, the, the substrate, the fabric that you're working on, and then what you're dealing with as a, at an application level. Hell, uh, I mean, yes. <laughs> we we at, at Orbit's virtual machines have been a, a huge advance. I, I'd love to see them, you know, we're, Large place with legacy code, everything's harder, right? You're 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 working things through, but uh, virtual machines have done absolute wonders for us. I couldn't live without them right now. No, oh, cool. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I mean the ability to, to to provision environments, you know, so that it, when you have only hardware, you're looking at you, you've got an environment, it's all provisioned, it's all set up. Now everybody's got to share it. With virtual machines, you can now provision whole separate environments almost on the fly, which just gives you a tremendous amount of flexibility. I'm not worried if there's a a big project going through the pipeline, somebody's using one of the shared environments, and I've got a bug fix or something I want to change, and it's in the middle of their testing cycle. I'm not going to go push that in there and risk blowing them out of product, you know, blowing them out of their out of the production deployment. Uh, so I got to wait. With a virtual environment, I no longer have to wait. I can set up my own environment relatively easily. Uh, all right, so continuous integration. This is the, really at the, the heart, of, heart of all this, super, super important. Uh, small batch sizes we talked about. Look, finish a story, keep your story small, keep your work in progress low. You don't want a pile of code that's not in production sitting back there. You want to create the smallest amount of code, push it out to production, and then if you make a mistake, you've only made a small mistake. So you think about, if I have a big mountain of code, I, I'm, it's, it's a liability, it's risk for me. So I've just done all this work, I've spent all this money to build up this big mountain of code, and now I go push it out into production, and I'm not even talking about bugs, but the customer doesn't like it. Well, God, I just wasted a whole lot of time, you know, uh, and now I've got to correct that and change it. All that, yeah, it's, it's a, you know, it's a big waste of money. So if you work on small batch sizes, and you push things out to co production frequently, uh, you know, you're, uh, you're not, you don't have that work in progress. You don't have that big liability. So it's all about feedback. And, you know, feedback comes not just from production, but at all stages along this continuous deployment pipeline. So I finish code. I push it in. You know, I go through the process that we talked about. And finally, it makes it into mainline after my review, and it gets pulled out into this, into this continuous integration system. And the beauty of that is that I'm... I'm integrating fast. So I'm going to see if I've done something that screwed somebody else up. Even when you're working in, in a very small open source project, if you have more than two people working on it that are on the phone all the time, this becomes very helpful because you can't keep track of what they're doing. So the sooner you get your stuff out there and integrated, the faster you see if there's a problem. You go and, uh, you go and integrate a whole bunch of code, late, big, and it blows up you know, finding, finding the source of the problem becomes much, much tougher. Uh, there's a technique that we use here that kind of goes back to, that goes back to this whole bringing everybody together, making everything everybody's problem. When you push code into a CI system and the CI build breaks, you're going to set a kind of a global variable and you can implement this however you want, but that is, you know, put something in a database, whatever you will. That's going to interact with a hook in your configuration management system, or sorry, in your, your source control system. So as soon as, config, as soon as continuous integration goes red, you flip a switch and you make it impossible for anybody to commit more code. So you, you stop the train at this point. If you're stopping the train on, you know, big, huge commits that are really hard to debug and really hard to find the problem, you're going to cause yourself some headache. Why would you want to stop the train then? The reason you want to stop the train is because now it's everybody's problem. 
If you're not using this technique, then I guarantee what is happening is that you have a CI system that has, a, you know, Jenkins or well, that has got red, 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 green, green, red, 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 and there might be a couple of people on the team that really care about it, and so they're always the one going, fixing the CI, fixing the CI, and the rest of the team just kind of letting them do it because, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't have any effect on them. System like this will prevent that from happening. Can you tell me how I'm doing on time? I can't see. Okay, so CI system will prevent, th this kind of uh, development will prevent that from happening. Um, it's a really, really slick little technique. Deployment, again, at first keep it simple. So you get your software through CI. The CI system packages it up and it creates this package and now you need to push it out onto staging or push it into production. You probably have two environments before production. You know, most companies would have two, you know, two or more environments. Same package the whole way through, binary package so you don't have to rebuild. Uh, those boxes, if, if your dev box is a Mac and the other, you know, that's, that's fine. CI will build it. But your box that you're doing CI on, your box you're doing staging in and performance, and your box you're in production on ought to be the same OS, same version, same config. Um, so you're pushing this package out there. The key is that you have a repeatable, simple process. When you're going to try to start implementing this stuff at your company or you're just doing it at home uh, just to play with it, the very first thing you need to do is get your stuff packaged and then figure out what the simple manual process is that you're pushing under this box, kicking off your performance test, and then pushing into the production box after that. And it should be the same for both of those environments, and it should be the same for all people that have to do it within your organization. You can use Bash, you can use Ruby, you can, you know, whatever way you want to do it. Um, but it should be, sim actually I got ahead of myself there. So the manual process is first, then you want to automate it. Once you have a manual process that's written down on a piece of paper, you can automate it. You first got to have an algorithm though, a process. Now that you have it, go ahead and automate it. You don't need to bring in Puppet or Chef at this point. I love Puppet, Chef's great. Uh, you, don't, that, you don't need it. Uh, start out, g getting the process right is more important than anything else. So just script it up, especially for small shops. You know, that's just a lot of overhead. It takes a long time to learn those tools. You know, Ruby or Bash, whatever, whatever, is your, whatever is your preference. Ah, what? Actually, I want to talk about one other thing here, um, and then rollback is key. So, you need to figure out a way, and there's a whole bunch of ways to do this. That when you get a package out into production, uh, that you can roll back. So, simplest way to do this: Simlinks. Uh, you know, maybe your initial packaging is a tarball. Uh, a binary compiled, I don't recommend this, but you know, it, you, as you're practicing or getting the hang of it, and you put one into, you know, one version directory and the other into the other version directory, and most package managers worth anything will do this for you. And, you know, in the center you, you, you have a sim link which points to the executable of, you know, version two, and if version two goes all wrong on you and your monitoring system says, hey, you got a problem, you're gonna kick your sim link back over to version one, and you know, now you've, uh, you've gotten around the problem. There's more. There's whole, all kinds of things you can get in with orchestration. And all. If you start thinking about all that, you get yourself mired down. If you're in a company and you want to get this going, pick a simple application for which the simple case holds and then just get your, you know, get your, your tracer bullet through the system and do it as simply as you can and learn from it and then build up where you have your problems. Fix the problem areas. Now, deployment part two, this is where... Uh, is where it really starts to get cool, using CM and virtualization and cloud uh, in order to, to, to really you know, kick this into high gear. So uh, capacity management and disaster recovery are two really kind of tough nuts to crack. And it's, it's going down this path that, that we can ultimately solve those. When you embrace that infrastructure as code concept, so let's say you got a, with CM, with two tools, CM and a, and a good bootstrapping system, you, you, can, you can get this set up. So you've got this kickstart program, puts your base OS image on the machine. Now you develop all other, you develop, you code the rest of the infrastructure in a CM tool like Puppet. You check that stuff all into a version control system. You provision your machine, you know, you, you, you get your machine provision, now you, run, you get you know, basic Puppet on it or Chef, whatever your preference is. You get that running, you get your, you know, your baseline OS image, now you layer on your applications. So now the whole thing just goes pear-shaped and uh, you, know, you got this huge problem, you know, the hard drive, you know, your SAN crashes or something like that and you just have no way to get to it. If all of your infrastructure is code, meaning your, 
your base OS image, your infrastructure, your, your actual configuration, you've got your application services, and then you've got a backup of your application data, so meaning your, your databases and things like that are backed up. Now all that stuff is versioned, it's in, a, it's in repositories, it's in backup system, you can bring your application back up with, uh, it's never easy, but you can, you can start going down the path of making it easy. Second thing that's just absolutely amazing in the idea, and is, uh, is auto scaling. So capacity management, the way we typically deal with that is we, we look at the way our application functions, we look at our monitoring system, and then we try to make an intelligent guess about, all right, how many machines are we gonna need next month when the traffic really starts coming in because it's such and such a program. With cloud, you, you can, because you can programmatically control instances with cloud and uh, configuration automation or configuration management, you can watch your monitoring system, you can see trends in the monitoring system, and then you can start provisioning boxes on the fly based on those trends. Because again, all of your infrastructure is automated, it's all just code. You can script it out. And this isn't a pipe dream, this is actually happening in industry today. And then last, but absolutely not least, something that, that definitely needs to be focused on is monitoring. As you get this initial pipeline going, you pick an app within your company or, or you know you start a new project and you get this basic pipeline going just to, to, to learn from it, uh, at the very end of it is, is monitoring. And a lot of people just kind of forget this. Uh, but it's, you know, again, it's like building an airplane without the, without the, without the dials. It's really not a smart idea to fly it. Um, this monitoring should be able to give you real-time feedback, and here, here's, the, here's the key, you know, going back. I, I try to keep this away from, at least part two, kind of more away from the social aspects of all this, but monitoring is a big thing. You want to co-locate all your people. You don't want silos. You want dev and ops and uh, design and product and business, all these people kind of sitting together, working together. They all need to be concerned about when some, you know, if something goes into production or not. If, you're mon if you push something continuous delivery style out into production and your monitoring trap sen sends off an alert, says, hey, something's seriously gone wrong, such that we might need a rollback or whatever, that same alert will do the same thing to your build system or to your, your, uh, your source control that configuration or that uh, continuous integration did. It's going to stop it. So you're going to stop the presses, done. That makes it everybody's problem. Everybody needs to make sure this thing gets fixed. To that end, everybody needs to make sure that they've got the monitoring systems and a bunch of metrics on their desks. At all t it's everybody's problem. Everybody ought to have it running, not just the network operations center. Everybody ought to care about it. So in the, in the interest of keeping it simple to start out with, get your system out there. Pick a couple of things. Pick a couple of metrics that you want to take a look at that you know are important that you, know, you can identify as being critical right away. Configure alerts and configure the system to stop when an alert happens. And then, you know, either it happens in the wild or you can force something to happen and you can test the reaction and just, you know, test that the whole system works. But in any of these steps, don't get caught up in trying to boil the ocean. Don't get worried about orchestration and what are the different types of, you know, rollback scenarios that I might have. And pick in a place where you don't have to deal with that stuff. Um, try to do one simple step, whether it be for CM, uh, whether it be for CI, whether it be for monitoring or packaging or deployment or whatever, pick something simple and, you know, get a slice going down through the middle. They call it a tracer bullet. Fire the tracer bullet through the whole system. Pay your integration costs up front. Figure out what it's going to take to connect this whole thing and then just start layering it up, building it up and building it up. And then when you're done with that, make sure that you, you know, come to uh, meetups and come to conferences and talk about it so the rest of us can learn about it. So thank you.